So here in Module 1, Lecture 3, we'll be talking to Professor Claire White, who's Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at Cal State Northridge. She'll be explaining what cognitive science of religion, or CSR, is, what makes it distinctive as an approach to the study of religion. The reason I think she's particularly appropriate to be the person talking about this is her position at Cal State Northridge is actually the first one created in North America specifically for the cognitive science of religion, so within a religious studies department, but dedicated to the cognitive science of religion. So I feel like the creation of this position and her hiring is really a landmark in the growing acceptance of CSR as not just some kind of fringe movement, but actually a legitimate way to study religion with, within the broader umbrella of the academic study of religion. So let's now turn to Professor White. At the heart of this new movement, the cognitive science of religion, this revolution, were really two key ideas. One, that the mind is necessary but not sufficient to explain religion. And for it to be sufficient, we really need to understand human culture. And the second is that we need a scientific approach to the study of religion. Now, although we can't point to anything and say this is the cognitive science of religion because it's new and expanding, it's in a state of flux, theories and methods are being challenged, all of the hallmarks of a good science, may I add. There are five key principles, ideas or commitments that we can say you have to minimally accept in order to do cognitive science of religion. Now the first of these is the idea that there is no such singular naturally occurring category to which we can point to and say this is religion. The second principle is that religion can and should be explained scientifically. The third principle is that in order to explain religion scientifically, we must fractionate it into its psychologically meaningful units. And once we fractionate them, we can then build them back up again to explain religious ideas and systems in their entirety. The fourth commitment is that religious ideas and practices are actively filtered and processed by the human mind. That is to say, we distort and recall and encode information in predictable ways, much like we do with language and music. And the final point, if religion, like music and language, can be explained by understanding the human brain and its interaction with the cultural environment, we don't need any specialized domain to understand and explain religion. In a sense, this means two things. One, Religion is cognitively natural, and two, religion, in fact, is not special. One of the aims of the cognitive science of religion is not to produce another or better description of religion, but actually to explain it. Now, what do we mean by explaining religion? Well, explaining it really entails two things. One, we have to know about the socio-cultural environment, and two, we need to know about the underlying psychological pan-human tendencies or building blocks that make up these behaviors and ideas. So when we take a religious tradition, let's say for instance, Christianity, it looks like it's a very unique phenomena. The same can be said when we bring in other religious traditions, let's say for the sake of argument that this robot is Hinduism, and let's say that this house is Buddhism. Now, when we start to look at religious traditions separately, they look remarkably different. They're constructed in very unique ways. So if we are just to examine Christianity by itself, as traditional religious scholars who are specialists would do, we can see that it's unique, it's very different. Likewise, we could do the same with the other traditions. However, cognitive science of religion takes as its starting point not the differences, but the similarities. The natural question next is, well, where do the similarities come from? And this is what makes the cognitive science of religion approach unique. The similarities come from the human mind. Now, it's important to note that we can't just study these psychological predispositions on their own. If we do, here's what's gonna happen. We're going to get a lot of psychological predispositions, but we can't say anything about religious phenomena looking at these. So we need to take account of these psychological predispositions, so understand these individually. That's the cognition part. And then 
we need to look at these traditions also individually to understand how each one of them uh, forms and shapes these psychological predispositions to look like what is recognizably Christianity. And second, we need to understand how, when we take these components apart, they actually have similarities, even though those similarities are shaped in different ways. We talked earlier about the brain and how these individual building blocks represent a cognitive predisposition. So let's say, for example, that the green is going to represent cognitive predispositions that lead to religious rituals or ritualistic behaviors. Then these other blocks, maybe they represent altered states of consciousness that we have. Then perhaps these other building blocks represent deference to authority in certain religious traditions. There may be hundreds and thousands, we don't know. What we are trying to do is deconstruct these systems down into their constituent components, but then once we have explained and understood these individual components, we have a better chance of explaining religious systems in their entirety by then bringing back these individual tendencies to constitute the religious system, and voila, we now better understand how they function together. So here in lecture three, we've built on the material we looked at in lecture two in the sense that Professor White's trying to explain how CSR is taking the building block approach that was outlined in lecture two, but interrogating the blocks, if we want to think of it that way. So talking about what are the blocks, what are the structure of the blocks, where did they come from, why are they the shape and the color that they are, what are the evolutionary pressures that gave rise to these blocks. We'll look at this in great detail in modules two and three. Another important theme in this lecture is the idea that what distinguishes a cognitive science and religion approach from other traditional religious studies approaches is this attempt to get away from a blank slate model of the mind. So the idea that the mind is just an empty slate that can be written on, or it's a kind of general purpose sponge that just soaks up whatever's in the environment. And also getting clearer about what learning is. Learning is a term that's been used in the humanities sometimes as a magic catch-all phrase for how culture somehow mysteriously gets inside of people. One of the things that the cognitive sciences and evolutionary sciences more generally, and particularly CSR, has been trying to do is actually get more specific about what the mechanisms are of learning. How do people learn? Uh, what are the innate structures in the mind that prepare us to learn certain types of things and not other things? You can't just learn anything. What are the structures in the mind that filter what we learn? Breaking out of the black box view of the mind or of cultural learning and actually trying to see what the concrete cognitive mechanisms are that are involved in individuals acquiring cultural knowledge. What makes the cognitive science of religion distinct is this commitment to naturalism. So this means several things. So first of all, commitment to the tools of the sciences. And then also putting this all within an explanatory framework of evolution. So both genetic and cultural evolution, but trying to explain, again, in naturalistic terms, where these structures c come from and why they have the shape that they do. Dr. White, I think, made an important point that traditional religious studies because of its methodological variation, and, and I would say also a failure to really interrogate why religion exists, why religious cognition and behavior exists, tends to not focus on explanation so much. So the focus in traditional religious studies tends to be documenting diversity. A distinctive feature of cognitive science of religion is trying to explain where this diversity comes from. Another important theme is the idea that religion is natural. It's cognitively natural. So in other words, religious beliefs and practices emerge very early in development. So you see them very early on in children. They are natural in the sense that you don't have to teach them. So they're intuitive. They emerge spontaneously. They don't have to be taught formally in schools, unlike things like science or algebra. Third important thing is that they're very difficult to eradicate. When we talk about religious ideas as being natural, it means you don't have to teach them. It also means it's very hard to get rid of them through teaching. So here by the end of lecture three now, we have a good sense of what I'd call the nativist side of cognitive science or religion. So the way in which it focuses on the naturalness of religion, how a lot of religious cognition emerges from these innate cognitive tendencies we have. In lecture four, we're gonna to turn to the importance of culture and cognition. The fact that human beings are biological creatures and we can be explained through evolutionary theory just like any other organism in the world can be, but we're weird animals. We're uniquely cultural animals. 
animals. And so to understand human behavior and belief, we've really got to understand the dynamics of culture.